Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast and subscribing. Make sure you share it with your friends if you love it. And also, who do you think I should try to get on next? Message me at Jeff Groovy on Facebook or Instagram. It's about growing as a person. Your best is completely unique to you. Hey everyone, thanks for joining and welcome to episode 15 of Fuck Perfect. I am so happy to be here with my friend Nick Testa. Thanks for being on the podcast, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I love I love your setup. I love your mic and your headphones. And then obviously the beauty in the back, right? The, the the classic Mustang. It's it's not just a set piece. This is I'm talking to you from my actual little home recording studio that just happens to be situated. Actually, this garage door is making a little bit of noise. Hopefully, that won't be too no, much. No, no, no. You're good. I think I think the the microphone kind of cancels that part out. It's interesting too. Like this before I even get into it. Uh, like my, I used to have this thing called an office, and then like stuff behind me, like kids stuff starts squeezing and squeezing and my room gets tighter and tighter. So if I move right now, I'm going to hit like probably 20 Legos on the ground that you can't even see. It's true. The kids take over. I mean, this garage used to be all mine. And now it's like, yeah, it's like half the kids stuff now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let, let's get, maybe give people an introduction to, uh, of how you got to uh, where you are today. I mean, I, I remember before we get to that, I remember just kind of flashback memory lane running in Los Altos with you. I was on cross country, working at the deli, uh, seeing you perform in your, in your, in your band. And it's like, and it's funny, it's interesting to me when people have like these mutual, uh, connections say years ago, and then they kind of circle back and they've grown and evolved. And now they still have more mutual connections. Like there's still more things they have in common, even though that not, maybe not the same thing mm-hmm. that, that part kind of blows me away. Blows me away about, uh, say, you and I. But go ahead and give us your Nick Testa intro. Yeah, I mean, boy, where to begin? I mean, I think, you know, fitness was always part of my growing up because my dad was a, he's a triathlete, mm-hmm. was a triathlete. He's, he's a little older now, so he doesn't do it anymore. But like, like I grew up with the posters of Dave Scott and Mark Allen and these like pro triathlete guys. So once I got through my drinking and pot smoking phase of 14, 15, 16 years old, the next logical step was to start doing triathlon and stuff. So that meant, you know, joining the water polo team and doing cross country, like you mentioned, and, you know, and then racing my dad. Now my dad wanted me to be a wrestler because he was the wrestling coach of, of our high school. The feared wrestling coach. I hated wrestling, dude. I hated it so much, but I figured, you know, if I'm a kick-ass triathlete and can like beat my dad, you know, on a regular basis, then, you know, how bummed could he really be that I quit wrestling? So that's exactly what I did. So the triathlon, the running, swimming, biking through like the last two years of high school, like took over my life. But at the same time I was in a, I was in a band and that was taking over my life. So my life was really split into these kind of two lanes. And then once, once graduation hit, I kind of had to choose, like, do I want to, you know, pursue triathlon or do I want to pursue music? Well, there's no chance I was ever going to be a professional triathlete. Um, so I decided to per- pursue music. So we moved down to LA where fitness completely took a backseat to like rock star lifestyle. It was all like recording studios going on tour, you know, tons of recreational fun stuff. Um, so that lasted for a little while until it all kind of imploded. And then I moved back home and, and went to college, you know, and that's where like normal life took over, went to college got a job as a, you know, QA engineer at Apple and then the recession hit. And then I kind of had to like, you know, take a time out from that and then build up my own, um, production company doing, you know, photo and video and, and, and digital media and stuff. And then fast forward to like age 35, I'm, I'm, I'm closing in on 38 right now, but at 35, I kind of realized that like, I kept trying to inject fitness back into my life. But I would get like, you know, I would do kind of, I think what a lot of people do where they, they work out hard for a week or two weeks or even a month and then just completely drop off again. Mm-hmm. But I'd done that like, you know, umpteen times. But then at 35, something about the number 35, I'm like, this is it. I'm doing it. And that began this, this really strict routine of waking up every morning and hitting really, really solid workouts before work. At this point, I got a full-time job at a, a design company. Um, and it, it started and it, you know, a week strong, a month strong, a year strong. And now I'm going, you know, three years strong on this, like every morning with the exception of this last week, because life, normal life doesn't exist anymore. 
but uh you know so it's a combination of strength training and running i just don't have time with the kids and, and the wife and everything i don't have time for a triathlon training to swim to bike to run so i, I kind of picked the most potent one which is running and sort of went all in on that and then add the strength training in to just try to round it out and that's my regular my regular life now that's awesome how did you get into um uh into say di digital photography and, and production and stuff like that from was it a combination of what you did in your band life and you kind of had that experience there how'd you get into adding the photography and video where you got videography so, so when i was uh, a band guy a musician guy um i was always really impressed with the the engineers in the recording studios with like all of these buttons and boards and like to me it was just magic like these guys just knew which button to push to make this thing happen i thought that was so cool so when the band imploded um and i came back to the bay area i decided to go to school to get my degree in audio engineering and music production so i went to this funky school in the east bay called expression college for digital arts mm -hmm. my focus was in sound so i did learn how to do all the the you know recording studio and buttons and all that kind of stuff but it was also uh, in the beginning, it was more broad digital media. So it in included some photography, um, some digital filmmaking and stuff like that. Now, when I graduated with my bachelor's uh, of applied science and sound arts, I realized really quickly that uh, there's not a, not a whole lot of work for audio dudes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a few jobs out there, but like, you know, you look at a recording studio, that engineer has been there for 20 years and he's going to be there for another 20 years. They're not trying to hire anybody. So as I worked with, a couple bands uh, as sort of a part-time producer and part-time engineer, I kind of started documenting it with video. Little Back in the day, there's little flip cams. So oh, I'd make, yeah. I love those little flip cams. So I would make, you know, it's before, before the iPhones. So I'd make these little flip cam documentaries, um, and I'd kind of, you know, I would make one that sucked, and then the next one I made – sucked a little bit less and then i got a better camera and then just kept doing it and doing it and then that led to like a couple paid gigs here and there and then every paid gig i would have would upgrade to like you know better gear and within like two years so that kind of started in like 09 by by 2011 i had like a consistent client base a new skill set a portfolio and from 2011 to 2016 I was just slammed tons of work, tons of Kickstarter jobs. Video was what paid. And, you know, because I knew audio, I already had that in my back pocket as far as editing and stuff goes. But um, I got so much work that when I finally had kids and decided I need a real job with real healthcare and stuff, I had this massive portfolio and uh, really just took the first job that offered me a, a good package. So, Wow, that's, that's incredible. And you think I was just talking about uh, this with what was his name Steven Shaletsky, the guy from Simon Sinek, and he was. We kind of talked about how, even though you might have a perceived failure, uh, things don't go your way, it actually kind of sets you up for a future kind of slam dunk, right? Um, if you imagine, like maybe, uh, obviously, if you did have a uh, huge music career, right, you wouldn't have kind of gone down. The, using this, I mean, you, you failed in music in that area, and you had a skill set you took and went to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, which ultimately would lead to you, obviously having the family you have and, and being in the situation you have now. It's all like that butterfly effect, and it's like a lot of people forget about they they attribute like their butterfly effect or the where they are for all the good things in life, and they easily discount and blame all the bad stuff. Like I wish it ever happened. Well, actually a lot of times the bad stuff is the reason why you got to where you are. And yeah. When I look back at some of the bad stuff in my life. It's like, Oh, that actually was a pivotal decision that I made that led me to the next bad thing that made me the next decision you know, that led me here. Right. So it's crazy how that can just kind of work out. And the thing I had actually in common with you is third, the number 35 for some reason really like, clicked with me i liked i've liked 35 my whole life but but the idea is like when i hit 35 um i was already just sort of this quote self-appointed health coach which i think is there's too many of them but i but i did take the take it with a, a sense of responsibility and the weight of it like i need to learn more about it but i kind of really uh stepped up my game like 10 times 
to get, you know, the best shape I can with the constraints that I had. Cause obviously being a good father and being a present father is important to me or present husband. And so uh, obviously you're not going to be able to hit the gym for three hours a day, or maybe even go to the gym if it's far away or trying to figure out where your life fits into that schedule. If you, and so like, I think it's really cool that you kind of found that niche, like, okay, this is the time I'm going to hit before work. I'm going to, you know, do your, do running, do strength training and that stuff. So that's awesome. What, and like I ask everyone else on the fuck perfect podcast, what did you, what do you think in life, not health and fitness, but in life or in work, did you focus on perfection? And it doesn't have to actually necessarily be like 100% perfection. It could actually be, I must meet these expectations. Like I, and that could be the hundred, the same thing as a hundred percent perfection. Yeah. Right? Like, and then it was just causing you too much pain. And then you went to progress. Yeah. I, and that's music, man. That's the reason why the music thing imploded was because there was this expectation that it, it had to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't know, I don't actually know that I ever totally got over it, but I mean, when I was in the band in LA, um, we we were having a little too much fun, I think. And that would sometimes spill over into the shows where, look, even the best bands in the world make mistakes when they're playing live. But I, I feel like I took it so personally. Mm-hmm. Like I, you know, and it's part of it was because I was up in front of the band. Like I've, you know, kind of an ego thing. Like I'm the front man, like, you know, so if, if you flub a note, that makes me look bad, <laughs> which is bullshit. Sure. But, um, but like, I remember I used to get so frustrated if we didn't have an absolutely perfect show or, or me personally, if I didn't play perfectly or if the sound guy screwed up and the sound wasn't perfect, like it would absolutely ruin my life. And I think, you know, that's what ultimately led to, to me saying, screw this, I'm, I'm going home. Um, but then I, I continued to struggle with that because even, you know, into my thirties, I, I played in a couple other bands, not with the intention of being like, you know, that first band was, we're going to be famous. This is going to be our job. We're going to be rock stars and nothing is going to stop us because we were kids and we were idiots. But later on in life, in my thirties, it was more about let's have fun. Let's get some friends together. We'll go play a club and you know, everybody will have some drinks and have a good time. And it was a good time. Always a good time. I played with two bands. I played with this band, uh, Bliss is B who still play and another band called the filthy thieving bastards. They don't really play anymore. They were a super group of other bands and those other bands are doing well, which means the, the super group is sort of on hold. Uh, the Bastards were great because they do play perfectly. I can count on, on one hand with 100 shows with those guys how many times somebody screwed up. Those guys are aces. And it was great. Bliss is B, they're a loosey-goosey band and they would screw up. And that's another situation where even in my 30s, even in a band that I'm just trying to have fun with, I still would take it really personally when we wouldn't play a perfect show. And again, that ultimately, well, that wasn't what led to me leaving that band. That was because I got married and had kids and just didn't have time for a band anymore. But um, you got to pick and choose what you have time for. But I think it actually took away from, it took away from me having fun. It took away from me enjoying what I was doing. It took away from me enjoying playing music with my friends. And somebody would flub and I'd be like, oh, God damn it, we just blew the show. Everyone thinks we suck. Yeah. And, you know, truth is nobody, nobody cares, you know? I went, I went to a Foo Fighters show and the Foo Fighters literally had to stop halfway through a song because Dave Grohl screwed up and said, hey, let's just start it over again. Like, it's not a big deal, right? Right. You know, I think that's, that's really interesting because you even said uh, the Bastards were a perfect band and you can count on one hand how many mistakes they made even. So in the same sentence, you still acknowledge they were perfect even with mistakes because there was very few. Mm-hmm. But, but I know I know what you mean. Like that's kind of wh- why I even wanted to kind of why, why I focused on fuck perfect of the podcast was that I thought you either failed, perfection was was expected, so that was just even like break even, and if somehow you exceeded perfection, that was good. Like it was never good if it was perfect. It was as expected, mm-hmm. right? So I either so like ninety nine point nine percent was a failure to me with one mistake or anything uh perfect was what I, my expectation was so if it, everything went smoothly i'm like oh great it's sort of like and you kind of can reflect that into parenting too and i reflect this in the teaching and it's like okay or or a job 
if things go as planned, as expected, no one really fucking cares. Mm -hmm. No one, I mean, I didn't even like, when I was in uh, theater and in college, and I remember doing like, you know, having like big sound boards and lighting boards. And, you know, you want me to know, you want me to know all these buttons? Like, fuck. And I can't miss one <laughs> cue. Uh, and so it's like, all right, I'm going to show up and do my best, make sure I don't miss anything. And someone else fucks up. I'm like, whoa, you want me to still tell them good job? Like, I don't get that. Right. <laughs> so, like, I didn't get it um, in terms of like, okay, but I'm going to expect perfection of myself and that just be a standard that's actually a really high standard and it really sets you up for a lot of fucking pain like you're just constantly not meeting not meeting not meeting or when you do get perfection it's you're like okay good like or okay fine like you're not even excited about it right yeah and whether it was you know people that i help now with accounting calories or like they're focusing on the wrong thing the more the more i realized it especially with my mom how she's always chasing happiness chasing whatever it was like oh i'll be happy when i get this new house happy when i get this new car happy when whatever this happens and then she'd get it and it wouldn't wouldn't last it's the and you get it and then what's the next thing yeah what's the next thing because obviously if you think happiness is outside of you you're never going to have it yeah uh it's like it's inside it's your choice to focus on what's going going well and the moment i started to see the similarities and i don't think i've talked about this at all so I don't hope, hopefully people don't get super offended, but like when my mom passed away two years ago, that's when I really started to think about these things. Like you think about everything, but like, it, it's like, okay, I noticed this theme that she had. And I noticed in my life when I could detect where her mistakes was trying to avoid them, that I was really focusing on like, Oh, she was focusing on happiness. How can I not do that? Oh, let me focus on, you know, progress and a perfection. And it's like the immediate shift, even though nothing actually changes, just your perception. Mm -hmm. It just got a lot more happy, a lot yeah. more, more grateful for like, oh shit, I did do pretty good. I did do better than yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's, that's cool. And then you keep going forward. Right. And so I even tell people have a WTF plan, like uh, when things fail, because things are going to come up, like coronavirus is going to come up. Shit's going to go differently. Okay. What can I do? Right. Instead of focusing on, well, I can't do this. What what can I do? What can we do? Right. I mean, that's 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 today. You know, that's this weekend. I, I I've been training for a half marathon for the last three months, and coronavirus is now taking that away. So what can I do? Well, they I canceled can, the marathon, right? Canceled it. Yeah. So what can I do? I, I can go run thirteen by myself and just time it on my phone. But yeah, that's one of the things I love about running, though, is like there is this progress over perfection especially at this age mm -hmm. because i i got into running when i was uh well high school 16 17 right. and back then i could run a, a 5k in in 20 minutes at 38 years old i will never ever be able to run a 5k in 20 minutes it's just i can't right yeah and, and in my mind that's what perfect is i'm if i'm gonna go run the perfect 5k it's gonna be 20 you know 20 minutes but i'll never do it so what i can do is in 2020, I can run a 5K in the beginning of the season, and then I can see if I can run one at the end of the season slightly faster. That's right. it. It'll never be perfect. It'll no, never be 20 minutes, but, you know, maybe 25 minutes. We'll see. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Focusing on perfection. It's a good segue into your health and fitness. In, in what areas in your health or fitness did you used to focus on perfection and it just it was just causing you too much stress too much pain or whatever it was it was just bad and then you're like okay and that's a good example of, of going what you just did right into fitness but is there another example i mean there's 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 two there's one from my younger life which was competitive triathlon and just the fact that i wanted more than anything in the world to be a professional level triathlete mm -hmm. and having to come to the terms with that my my body, the way that my body processes oxygen, just from a, a VO2 max standpoint, mm -hmm. will never be what these pro guys can do. These guys could sit on their ass for six months and still kick my ass just because, you know, this is like what they do in Australia. They, they VO2 max test all of their, you know, their young athletes and whichever ones have the best performance. Those are the ones that they then groom to go to the Olympics. Like some people are just born natural, uh, 
with a born natural ability to process oxygen and you know lance armstrong's another good example take the drugs away and he's still a phenomenal athlete and he started yeah. in triathlon um so wanting to be at that level at that young age a 17 18 19 age and just like there's this, these kids who I used to race, uh, Brian and Brandon Beckman in Sacramento. And these kids in the Bay Area, they were they won the age group every single time. These guys were at the level. They are going to be pro athletes. I think they ended up not because of injuries or something. But these are the guys that I was racing every weekend. And it killed me that they were beating me by so much. And all I did was train. And I just had to come to terms with the fact that I could train all day, every day, and I'll still never quite be at that. It's just a body thing. I'll just, I'll never be at that level. That yeah. was super, super frustrating. And it's interesting too because there's, there's the, um, there's this great book by Carol Dweck called Growth Mindset, where a lot of people they focus on. It's basically the idea of tortoise and the hare. How the, you know, the hare had the talent, the rabbit had the talent, but didn't put effort involved. And the secret formula basically is effort will always win but effort combined with talent is like like crazy awesome right exactly so when you when you talk about the australian guys like when they when they can filter out the natural talent like okay now let's put in the effort mm -hmm. so there is that level of like you know, like obviously they say michael jordan right or larry bird and they'll, they'll win a championship and then the next day they're out shooting free throws again uh and it's like they did have insane consistency where at some point, talent can be overtaken if there's this level of consistent effort. However, if someone that do, does have talent also puts in consistent effort, it's like, oh, God, it's just a, 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 um, almost impossible to compete on that. Like, like you said, on that level. Yeah. You can yeah. And I, I mean, and I don't know if you remember and Andrew Hill from, from oh, when course, we were in Andrew, high school, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. another example. Like he's, you know, here's a guy who's just, he's a born runner, you know, he, he's a guy who, if he had never trained and just decided to run a mile one day could probably run a five minute mile, but he did train. He trained his ass off and he was born with natural ability. And in high school, the dude was, what was he running like four, 14 miles or something like that? Yes. Something, something, yeah, cra something, something crazy. Yeah, but so and then and then another frustration came later in life when you know at 35 I was super doughy. Mm -hmm. I was like fat, but I was just like <clears throat> just doughy, you know. <laughs> I, I quit drinking in '09, and sweets kind of took over after that. So it's like it was hard to to fight that. But uh, my goal was Brad Pitt Fight Club. That's my goal. When I started at 35, started working out. I'm like, that's yeah. what I'm gonna do, Brad. That's what everybody wants to be, Brad Pitt Fight Club. Right. And, I, and on my on my one year birthday anniversary of, of working out, I was shredded, cut down like, you know, 5% body fat, decent amount of muscle feeling good. And I'm looking at the photo of Brad and I'm just like, I'm just still not there. And I'm like, I gave it all I got. I don't think I'm ever actually going to be there. I think we just have different body types. I think I'm going to look good for myself and that's as best as i can do because i'm never gonna sure. look like brad pitt in bike club i'm just not yeah well on top of which he might have had expert uh, uh trainers along the way to kind of get him to that you know and that's kind of all he's focused on but yeah no yeah. I, I get like when you when you compare yourself to someone else's progress it can get it can get dicey you know um and that's and that's a tough thing like and that's the, to, that's a really good point to talk about uh even where i'm at most people that will come to me for whatever reason, they don't let, so they might say they want apps. They might want say Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt fight club kind of stuff. But in reality, they're either not going to get it or they deep down, they don't really want, it. they just want to get close. Right. Cause when, when you start to realize, okay, what I have to, what are the supporting actions I have to do uh, to, to get there, then maintain it. And you're like, I can't do what I can't eat what anymore. It's like, no, 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 no. They're, <laughs> they're like, I'm done. So, <laughs> the interesting thing to me is that I have to sort of maintain this level to get people to buy in that they that that's what they think they want. Uh, even though I don't really care about it, my whole thing is is health and happiness and how long you can keep it. Like, can you keep it up forever? Can you keep it up the rest of your life to to increase the longevity of your life to increase your happiness? And so, um, when people do come to me like, "Hey, I want to lose ten pounds for summer," I'm like, "Not not your guy." I don't want to, I don't even touch it. I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, yeah, it's really interesting to how people, they think they want to compare themselves to a certain thing or they see magazines and you, you talk, you see like Hugh Jackman interviews where he says, <clears throat> I was, I'm not that shredded as you saw in Wolverine, right? Like I'm, that was like for four hours. I saw that. Yeah. With the, the strategic dehydrating. And he was talking about how when he sits down, he's still got the fat rolls. Like they just, they got the good angles, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes like, and then, and then it's like, you'll start to see. So I, I'm, I'm taking this in a whole different direction. I'm super anti-trend. I can't stand trends. And so it's a weird for me to be in an internet sort of based business, social media. If I'm not going to ride the wave of trends. So I just kind of see them as like just little, they go up and they go down. And I see other people, other influencers, like people that are similar to me, they just go hop, 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 hop. And they, they force their, their message to fit in with a trend. You know, it's like, oh, when, when Ro- the, uh, Area 51 thing was happening like last year, mm-hmm. I knew a guy that forced fitness into Area 51. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, How, how's that even work? It, like, didn't, oh, it, was, it was so bad. And it was... And so, like, I see people do the, the trend hopping, and, um, and and it's like, you know, you, you look at these things where people will just go from one thing to the next, and they, they, they can't sustain it. You know, they can't sustain, like, I, I think it as, like, the person's not interesting enough, doesn't have anything deep down. So, if there were no trends anymore, they wouldn't have anything to say, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's probably why they do it. But, so, what do you got going on now, man? What do you... What are you looking forward to in the next, say, six months? Hopefully, the the world's not ending and everyone's just going to be (laughs) Wally. I mean, look, I'm a creature of of habit. I think most guys are creatures of of habit. Um, Routine. I'm big on routine. My routine has been aggressively disrupted in the last couple weeks. I'm definitely looking forward to getting the routine back because I don't really know how to make this work. Like waking up at home at 6.30 a.m. and like driving to work and trying to figure out how, like, you know, like my gate's too loud for me to open in the morning to go for a run. Like I'd wake up the whole house. So like I'm trying to figure out how to, how to make this work. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the, to the routine going back to normal. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to race season in the summer. Uh, again, I don't know what it's going to look like with everything that's going on. Um, I've already got my 5k PR set that I want to try to beat this year. So, you know, we'll see what comes up with that, but, um, you know, and I'm looking forward to my, I always try to do, I I would not call it a crash diet, but I definitely ramp up my training and try to clean up my eating, um, about a month before my birthday in, in late July. So I'm looking forward to sort of like every day is a struggle where I say, I'm not going to eat dessert. I'm not going to, you know, eat in bed as we're watching our movie before I go to sleep. But then I always end up doing it. But usually in that, you know, six weeks leading up to my birthday, I can kind of like clean it up and that'll kind of like give me some discipline for that, you know, kind of end of summer thing. So I'm looking forward to that. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to to real life again. This is, this is weird. Life is weird right now. Yeah. Life, life is, is pretty strange. And, you know, having like, obviously like our, our spring break is happening now. Our school district is not, is still open. I mean, they, they're just doing a regular week off and I think they're probably going to change their mind. Who knows? But the panic buying drives me nuts because even if you don't want to be a panic buyer, you kind of for forced into it because now you think, well, now I can't get regular shit. So I'm going to have to prepare, I guess, other people, right. That, I, that are doing this. I, I wasn't, I wasn't even planning on, on, stocking up until i went to the store the other day and i called my wife and i i said people are pulling everything off the shelf right now and she's like well just to be safe you know get some frozen burritos and get some <laughs> what's up kiddo <laughs> into the unknown. <laughs> oh my god my kids sing the same song dude <laughs> yeah how, how, old, how, how old is this one uh, almost six Oh, okay okay almost okay so you're the, yeah my kid just turned five this is my nick. name is nick hi nick hi <laughs> all right go see mama real quick okay but yeah i went i went to safeway for like for like two things and all of a sudden it turned into we'll get frozen burritos get tortillas get ramen yeah. get paper towels get the, and soon i had a 250 fifty dollar cart without even like that was not my plan going in there the guy in front of me, me 
spent $867 at the grocery store. I went on Thursday before the, the real ball hit the fan on, I can't say the, the real word, real word, but the, uh, the thing hit the fan on Friday, but I went on Thursday. And I was noticed like, man, there's a lot of people here. It's like Thanksgiving Christmas time right now. Yeah. And I didn't see anything, people like really, like really clean out stuff, but like, I, it's so funny to me because I tell people you got to eat more fiber, eat some more beans. You need to have that in your life. You got to keep things flowing. It's really important. And then I always know people like, oh, I don't like beans. And then all of a sudden I go to the, the section. It's that's gone. The beans are gone. Right. So everyone's, everyone's now a, a bean eater, but, uh, <laughs> I, I, I went I like just anything in a can anything that will be good for the next year people yeah, pe- getting like, you, and then the thing was like do you, what do you people think is actually ha- like people are getting sick i get it well, i don't understand, I don't understand the, that level of, of panic buying so i was there i was like i want to i got i don't think i haven't got anything extra i just got regular stuff so i'm hoping that stuff's there when we need it again um well one of the things i was going to tell you about uh about how you were talking about your you know kind of everything the coronavirus kind of sidelining or delaying kind of training and getting your routine back to normal and then wanting to kind of beat your pr i don't think i don't think you know this probably don't because it was just it was a weird time for me but my my last year uh was when your dad was coaching cross country oh yeah, right? yeah. I, for, I forgot that he did that and so he did that for a bit and i'm not sure if you were doing cross country at the same time at that when he was coaching it but yeah he did it and I remember, like, everyone's, like, super terrified of him. And I was already working at the deli, so I already, already, already knew him, right? And so – Just uh, for the listeners, my, my dad is known to be sort of we, – we ran the, the, the local deli that pretty much everybody ate lunch at, and he was known – this was kind of an act that he put on as sort of like the hard-ass drill sergeant, wrestling coach. You know, somebody was in the deli and didn't know what they wanted. Hurry up. Come on. Step up. Come on. Yeah. And uh, – Again, that was just an act, but even my, my wife went to the deli in, in high school. I didn't know her back then, but she said, yeah, I was scared of your dad. Even to this day at family gatherings, she gets freaked out. But. It was so it's really funny. Like I heard, uh, you know, all, all these stories and it's, it's, it's you're, you're going to love it. I don't think, I don't think I've ever told you because why would I, but, but the, uh, um, so he was, he was coaching that, that year and I was biking. I was in going down Mountain View, biking the practice before school even started by Maldonado's mm-hmm. um and uh I was on that street uh, right before my Maldonado I was on this by the 7-Eleven there's like a stop four-way stop there and I got hit by a car on my bike and the cars ran away when I I'm like oh man I gotta get to practice fucking you know uh <laughs> take test this coach so I get back on my bike <laughs> I bike I bike to practice and the first dad the first thing your dad says like hey you're late and then he's and he looks down and he's like you should go see the trainer though and I looked down, my legs like just bleeding. Right? Oh my damn! Legs, like bleed. So, uh, skip that story a little bit. But I had four. I got four stress fractures in my in my legs, uh, and so they put me on Aqua Jogger the whole season. Cause and that was that? terrible. It's terrible. It's embarrassing. It's like saying you wear a diaper, but like you're wearing like a life vest in the pool, and you just jog. Oh yeah, pool, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I've seen that. Yeah. So like and so, anyways, I I was there the you know the whole season, and and the, and I think I I don't know if he stayed the whole time. Oh, sorry, no. And then I was out the whole season. I was out all of track, and then the and then the track coach, the last race of that, I was like, man, I don't want to have my whole year of aqua jogger, on my last year. Uh, I asked the track coach, just put me in for the eight hundred. Just just give me something before I leave, and I finished fourth. I was like yes you know like, so like kind of like having this routine just blow up and yeah. and and still kind of focused focused on like what can i do and it's getting is squeaking in the last race I'm, I'm glad i wasn't dead last that was awesome being yeah. able to still like push myself and then and then when i would run because the doctor told me you're not running competitively like any ever again um then when i would run with friends either preparing for like a, a tough mutter or something like that I don't know how to not run competitively yet. I don't know how to try Cause when I start running, I'm like, oh, I can do this for fun. I, I can go. And then like all of a sudden it's like, you can go faster. <laughs> this little voice in my head is like, you can go faster. That's and, so funny. and then I push harder and I, I don't know how to stop that. I'm, I am consistently in cruise control mode. I think cause I'm, I'm always listening to something. I'm listening to podcasts or whatever. So I cruise, I get my heart rate up 
And I, I have to really concentrate and be faster. You need to run faster. And I'll, I'll have to really focus on kicking it into gear. Um, that, cause when I was younger, like I was always going fast cause I wanted to, you know, I wanted to win. I want to keep up. I don't want anyone to catch me, but, but as a girl, cause I've let go of that, of that need to be the fastest guy. And now I'm just doing it because like, it makes me happy and yeah. I'm trying to like shed some calories and keep my lungs healthy and keep my heart healthy. So I'm like, you know what? what? Second mile, totally fine with that. Where young me was like, bro, you got to beat seven minutes every single mile when you're training. It's like, I, right. I have to like, so now I, I have designated days where those are like my, like Wednesdays are like my speed days. We're like, I'll, I'll, I might only run three miles, but I'm going to run those three miles race pace as fast as I can. And I have to like every minute or so I have to say, no, nope, no, nope, kick it up. Don't like, don't let up, kick it up, kick it up. And it's as an older per, not older, but you know, as a grown up now, it's definitely harder, harder to tap into that, uh, that race mentality, that competitive speed mentality and not just putting yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah. No, yes. I guess I'm, I'm the opposite. So I just, I just try not, I try not to run at all. That's why, and that's what kind of let me down my path of, of where I've chosen to get fit, mm -hmm. uh, like the at home workouts and kind of stuff like that. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, just as long as I'm not running, I'm, I'm okay. But sometimes the competitive thing comes out, but, uh, but yeah, not always. And the, the other funny story I'll share with you, um, I'll, I'll share with you off the air. They, they don't need to hear it, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Nick. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> awesome.